Michelle, Michelle Walker, it's wonderful to have you here this evening. And uh, I thought we'd start um, by first of all telling us a little bit about the River Trust, and then I want to find a little bit about your journey to the River Trust, and then we can uh, share our uh, interest around data for keeping our, our environment clean and sustainable. So tell us about the River Trust first of all. Thanks Nigel. Well um, yeah thanks for having me tonight. It's really nice to be here. Um, so the Rivers Trust is the umbrella body of the Rivers Trust movement and um, we represent about 60 local Rivers Trusts who are um, committed to action to really clean up our rivers and restore them and do that with a, an ecosystem approach and a catchment based approach. So it's really about working in partnership. Rivers Trust don't own any land, so they have to work with landowners, with businesses and find the ways that we can we can solve a problem through multi benefit solutions. And that requires a data driven approach. As you can imagine, we're trying to look at, you know, how to target resources at a catchment scale, not just sort of individual sites. So. And my background is um, environmental management and GIS. I did a master's in Edinburgh a long time ago. I dread to think how long ago. And I've always loved rivers and I've loved water, as you can tell from my, uh, my sort of swimming passion. So this is just my absolute dream job, really. It's combining those two loves, integrated environmental management and open data and really putting data in the hands of people who can turn it into solutions. So it's interesting, isn't it, that, that environmental data has often been an organising um, uh, challenge, actually, for um, lots of civic society and was one of, I think, if I think back, the early days of open data, much of it was being promoted by people who were concerned, actually, about the quality of everything from on land air and in the water, you know. Uh, where was toxic waste being done, what was happening in our atmosphere and the air we breathed and what was happening in in our water supplies and around our coasts. So give us a sense of, um, uh, I guess, I mean, data has always been at the center of that concern. I remember some of the early work, the environmental agency that we're working with was around bathing water quality, of course. Now, you know, that's a long time ago, you know, as we were, as we were beginning this journey. And you, you like to think that sometimes history is, uh, can at least be seen to be somewhat progressive, although of course, as we're witnessing right now, that's not always the case. So um, where are we in terms of the actual quality of our, uh, yeah, of our water assets? So that's a really interesting question, given some of the headlines we've seen over the last year, because we've had, on the one hand, you know, groups like ourselves publishing things like our State of the Rivers report that shows you know, we're in a really serious, dire state of affairs. And then you've got, um, you know, environment agency and government coming out with lines like our rivers have never been healthier. And it's a complicated picture. Some things have improved a lot. Certainly, you know, you go back 30 years ago when the water industry was privatised and there was a huge amount of progress made in the first maybe five, ten years. But we've seen a real backwards decline. And, um, you know, a lot of the, the pressure is coming from development and growth and we're not seeing any kind of um, match in terms of regulating and keeping control of that and I think that's the problem we don't have strong regulation and enforcement that that really controls this sort of economic growth so the rivers and the environment are suffering there's nobody really kind of protecting them at the moment and those of us in the, the sort of NGO sphere and the environmental sphere are seeing the consequences of that with the, the, the state of our environment. And we're, we've got less and less data to prove that with. So, you know, we're trying to fill those gaps now that the decline in government monitoring is leaving behind. So we'll come on to that, but it's interesting. I was, I was looking at some figures. I mean, the Environment Agency itself, I mean, it has a big budget, um, a billion pounds, more or less. but. Most of that's for things like flood protection, or most of it's for things to deal with the consequence of development, I suspect. The amount that's directed towards the concerns you have around monitoring pollution, monitoring outflows, that's, that's been reducing. Yeah, it really has. Year on year, we're seeing a decline in that. And, you know, without data and evidence, we can't um, direct the sort of investment that we need. There's huge potential now for things like green finance and nature-based solutions that we can invest in and solve these problems, you know, not just 
the problems with pollution in our rivers, but you can, you know, the same solution can reduce flooding and it can, you know, um, tackle the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. But we need the evidence to convince funders that they're putting their money in the right place. So, yeah, OK, so tell us about the, the data ecosystem in, in your world, because that's how we often try and think about it in the ODI. And, and often we talk about data as infrastructure, you know. So what bits of the data for our water systems uh, of that infrastructure is missing uh, or and what do we have and how available is what we have? Give us a paint a picture of that. Okay so there has been real progress I mean I joined the Rivers Trust 11 years ago now and when I first started it was really hard to even get access to the data that government held um, you know and we've seen huge progress through the Inspire Directive and the, the sort of open data movement now it's so much easier to get hold of those national data sets so that's brilliant and we work really hard in the Rivers Trust to put that data into the hands of the local trusts and the catchment partnerships that can then use it to work with their funders and partners to, to do good. So that's been really good news. But obviously, if the, the background data has been declining in density and, and quality, and meanwhile the pressures on the environment have been increasing, that's where the gap lies. And we've always seen local communities and local groups like Rivers Trust and catchment partnerships trying to fill those gaps with citizen science and with their own monitoring. But what we know is that without some national coordination of that, you've got a really piecemeal picture and it's quite chaotic and it's very challenging for anyone to combine those different local data sets together because they're not using standards and they're not using you know, a single data platform or an architecture. So that's what we're needing to tackle next, I think, is, is bringing some order and standardisation to that local evidence picture and putting that, that kind of gathering and interpreting and using of the evidence into the hands of local communities. Right, yeah, yeah. So it's a mixed picture. I mean, th there are data assets, national data assets that are being made available. So here's the question. Who, ha who, who are the prime actors in this whose data you would like to see made available? Well, definitely the water sector. I think, you know, without doubt, there's a lot of information there that we would like to see opened up and made transparent because, you know, you've seen through the, the sort of last year in particular, the whole kind of debate around um, untreated sewage in our rivers and the way that um, the whole system works, you know, with operator self-monitoring and a real lack of trust in the public in what's going on. So I think the water sector has a long way to go to, to open up their data. But it's the same with, with businesses and anyone who's got an influence on, um, on our rivers and their, their catchments and the, the sort of wider landscape. Let's get it out there, improve that trust. If you haven't got anything to hide, why not open it up? And I understand that there's commercial sensitivities, but you've got to balance that with, you know, we're all customers and consumers and we want to believe that, you know, we're putting our consumer power in the companies that are most responsible. So we have a, a regulator uh, in this space. We have Offwatt, and uh, I know it's a regulator that you're working with and we are too as a matter of fact so we we often think that regulators might be one of the levers um the ways to get um the uh the sectors they represent organized and marshaled so tell us how you work with them and in particular the project that you've uh, you you've re well recently secured yep. so we have um pulled together a project which is um it's ambitious for sure it's an innovation and transformation project called um, the Catchment Systems Thinking Cooperative. So it's an off what innovation funded project with 12 water companies as partners and a further 12 organisations from academia, from the environmental sector. And what we're looking to do is develop um, something that we're calling the Catchment Monitoring Cooperative. So it's going to be that national framework to standardise the, the gathering and the the organising and the use of environmental data and we're partnering with water companies because they need that information back as well they don't have the information they need to change the way that they're investing in solutions so 
At the moment, they're very geared towards engineering solutions and, and carbon intensive, you know, end of pipe solutions that, that engineers know what they're doing with. If we're looking at tackling the, the sort of biodiversity crisis and the, you know, reducing our carbon footprint, we've got to work in a different way. We've got to have nature-based solutions upstream and engineers don't know how to do that. And it's, you know, it's really difficult for people who are used to that level of certainty to work in a different way. So what we want to do is engage local communities, citizen scientists and, you know, multiple collaborative partners in improving that evidence base, gathering the sort of information that can help you target those solutions where they're going to make a difference. So you're trying to fill, fill in the missing parts of that data infrastructure. OK, so what kind of data would this be? Everything from, you know, biodiversity data, things like invertebrates in a river that can tell you so much about the water quality and the, the habitat quality, right through, you know, water chemistry data, um, flow data, river habitat data, soil data. Soil is really critical. Soil management is critical to, to water management and, and ecosystem health as well. So it's going to have a very wide scope um, and we are testing this out in eight demonstrator catchments and what we aim to do is um, come up with a set of standardised methods, facilitate local groups to train volunteers, get the communities out both collecting data, but also getting engaged in what it tells us, what it means, um, and then feeding that data into some of the decision support tools that are being used to make big investment decisions on, you know, water company investment, but also things like green finance and um, you know, directing local uh, flood funding and things like that. So, we'd be big fans of this approach, right? So, you can imagine helping us build a data infrastructure, backfilling, determining ahead of time what data you might need, thinking hard about standards, um, the categories of data. So, the challenge often is presented, I, I've been involved in various citizen science projects over the years, and one of the things you get, funny enough, is that the the professionals on the other end are always kind of sceptical about the quality of the citizen science. So there's this, our other big pillar of work here, of course, is data assurance. How can you be assured that the data is of a certain standard quality? Now, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, because I've often been really amazed at the quality of what can be produced by citizen-based movements. Once you've got some calibration and some process of induction, it's just very impressive. And we live in a world where the nature of the uh, collection regimes we have, the sensors we can put in people's hands, the methods we can give them are really quite robust. So is that a big part of what you're looking to do with the programme? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of the, the sort of baselines that we've got for starting this is trying to turn around a bit of cultural resistance to things like citizen science, community monitoring. You know, some of the, the partners that we're going to be working with I've always said, oh, no, your data's not good enough. You know, we are the holders of the truth. And I think we're trying to, with this transformation project, turn around some of that thinking and accept that no one organisation holds all of the truth. And if we can come up with some um, standards for the, the data formats and the equipment that's used, and we can show how, if you effectively train and support your citizen scientists and staff, and um, make sure you maintain the quality of that data and then make it accessible and available and open that you can have really good evidence. And we are taking a, a tiered approach to this. So we're looking at how we can combine through a weight of evidence approach, different tiers of information. So you might have a really broad citizen science tier that has big spatial and temporal coverage across a catchment and narrow down with more certain and robust data, but you can't cover such a big area or, you know, such a large time frame. But if you can combine all those together in a weight of evidence approach, you can actually get some really good information that can inform where you invest your money and it can show you how effective your measures have been and, you know, improve your, your sort of adaptive management. And how does that play into a what we see is an emerging uh, uh, area of remote sensing. I mean, are the new technologies uh, able to help 
at large scale remote sensing? Can you actually tell something, for example, about oxygenation states of rivers or the, the kind of things or, or the opacity of rivers that might tell you something about sewage outfalls, those kind of things? Are you able to tap into that? Definitely, that's part of the plan with this. It's, you know, how can we integrate things like remote sensing, you know, Sentinel-2 is, you know, fantastic resource now that could, um, for example, spot land use change in order to target your on the ground in situ monitoring in a more agile way. And combining that with real time sensors as well and being smart about how you combine multiple sets of evidence. You know, we really still want those kind of citizens and citizen scientists involved. We see that as a really powerful part of the picture. So it's not all about technology, but it's using the technology in a, in a way that can optimize the resources that you've got. So let's come back to the um, to those water utilities and uh, and off what now. We heard just last year um, Southern Water record fine millions of pounds, uh, excoriating comments from the judge in the case, um, and a real concern that actually um, well that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's tons of stuff going on like that, but also how do we know that there are serious efforts to to reform? So question people would ask in many, many other areas is how hard is real-time capture of data from either the primary treatments or the outflows? I mean, why is this so difficult? Well, I don't think it is. Um, I think a lot of the information is already being captured. Um, it's just not maybe open and shared, which is what we're pushing for. It's more transparency on what already exists. And, you know, what we are seeing is the real power of putting data and evidence in the hands of people locally who want to push for change. You know, we are all water company customers and if we make our wishes known, then we can change the way that things are done. And what we always push for is an evidence-based approach. So we're trying to sort of empower the local communities really to collect evidence and facts so that what they're pushing for is based on reality rather than pure emotion because sewage is a very emotive issue as you've seen in the media um, but you know we've got to be realistic about where we are and the challenge that we face so you know let's get out there let's put data and evidence in the hands of people who can then go to their their water company as a customer and say this is what I want. So we're kind of going back to the roots of some of the original open data um, civic society uh, motivations here, which is really uh, very interesting to hear. I mean, it's certainly the case that in a number of areas, progress made at one point seems to have been kind of progress lost in other areas and contexts. Um, some areas have become, I think, recognized now as, as really consequential, not least because they have some quite damaging health effects. So we now understand that airborne pollution particulates really are bad news. And uh, we, we've got some real sense of what the mortality off the back of that is. And it's quite hard for a, a city not to be noticing uh, what those rates are, the sides of roads or in particular um, uh, uh, urban yeah. settings. What is the, what do we know about the, I mean, it's unpleasant, but what do we know about the health effects of, of polluted rivers? We know very little. That's the problem. There is no public health monitoring of our rivers in this country, or there wasn't until Ilkley was designated as a bathing water last year. That's the first site where government are required to monitor for public health, not just for. Can you explain that? Just, just, just explain. So that. they, because it's now a designated bathing water, the government are required to. Um, monitor bacterial water quality, which is one of the indicators for, um, you know, how damaging it could be to swim in that river, which obviously I'm very interested in. So without that designation, um, there's no requirement for government or water industry to, to measure the impact of things like sewage. But it's not just sewage, it's agricultural runoff. You know, that's the other huge problem we have in this country is the, the pollution that's coming from agriculture and, you know, things like septic tanks and misconnected domestic drains. And how does it work? I mean, again, some one of the challenges often is, is the, you look at the way in which the country's public services and administrative geography is 
broken up and it's incredibly different. You know, no border is the same for whether you go from health to policing or education. They're all kind of different boundaries and borders. So often when you come to aggregate data, you know, you're not aggregating over the same spatial range. It's very challenging. How does that work in water with respect, say, to the devolved uh, administrations, uh, to particular areas? Is that, a is that a challenge? Massive challenge, yeah. Um, particularly with us, because we work across England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole. And trying to, you know, even just the, the collating of the data that already exists and trying to match it up across boundaries is massively challenging. And I don't really see a recognition of that at government level, really, that, you know, those who have to work with government agencies in a cross-border setting, it's hugely challenging. You know, river catchments don't stop at the border and we've got to, we've got to get more join up. Um, yeah, as, as a minute, that's a good point. So, so the administration certainly, and then the those who are charged or have statutory obligations to sort this out, like the Environment Agency. We talked about them earlier on. I was, I'm not. I'm, I'm a great fan of the Environment Agency. They just have to be given the resources to to kind of do the job that we required of them. I, I noted um, just yesterday a story that noted that 93% of cases that were put forward for serious pollution. Uh, were actually downgraded. So um, that's quite a... What's the story there? Well, it's really worrying, isn't it? Especially when, um, you know, with the, the sort of Brexit Freedom Bill, we're talking about cutting red tape and reducing regulation. When I hear those words, you know, I see the reduction in resourcing of our regulators, and that's not a good thing for anyone. It's not good for the environment, obviously, but it's not good for responsible businesses because they're not playing on a level playing field with businesses that are cutting corners and getting away with things that should be prosecuted you know we don't have polluter pays in this country at the moment we just don't pollution pays because it's actually profitable to cut those corners and with very little so chance. So the incentives are all misaligned they're Absolutely. all perversely aligned and that's again often a, a huge challenge for us. So as you collect, uh, as your project unfolds and you endeavour to kind of collect high quality standardised data, so where does that data sit? Another major programme for us here at the ODI are the concept of data institutions. You know, what do we need to set up in terms of organisational architectures as well as the technical architecture and the um, human resource? Um, what, how will that work? So that is what this project needs to work out. So we are looking to start from a place where, you know, everything's everywhere and slightly chaotic in terms of local data and move us to a point in the sort of three year time frame of this project where we have a strategy and we know what needs to be done. Because, you know, what we haven't set out to do is build one big IT platform and sweep everything aside because, you know, it's risky and you know what I big IT project doesn't get delayed so we're starting with a strategy which is trying to join up the existing platforms that are there and um, you know develop APIs for um, the platforms that are there that are already collecting data and obviously where we are looking to to build new platforms to make sure that they are open and using industry standards so we can reuse data and plug it into the models and decision support tools seamlessly. And how much work is there to do on just developing these open uh, data standards, I suppose you would say? I mean, again, one of the battles we had was trying to find ways of getting beyond proprietary formats, trying to come up with open formats, things that would be agreed across different uh, agencies. Um, that's part of the active work, is doing that, actually data engineering at the end yeah. of the day. Absolutely. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of the work that's gone on in the public sector has given us a roadmap. So it is really fantastic to have that kind of oversight. You know, I mean, that's been most of my career is kind of looking at how um, open data is unfolded. So we're not starting from ground zero, which is fantastic. And we've got some brilliant partners on the project, you know, including people like CEH, who are, you know, masters at, at sort of combining data together and managing it. So, I mean, the Rivers Trust have a good, strong technical team, but we're, we're very small fry in this. So, you know, as always, we work in partnership and we are pulling in the people who can help us. And, you know, it's got to be a collaborative effort, this. We've got to 
align around a strategic direction and start moving towards that and then pull in the funding to deliver it. So my other question kind of was to um, yeah, I mean, trying to trying to relate it back to the fundamental um, driving uh, programs in the ODI and one of them the, the fourth is this idea of data literacy so so what is it we can do need to do so that people out there generally get a sense of what the challenge is, you know, how good or bad or how, uh, how much more needs to be done. And again, you take the COVID example, everybody's become a kind of a, uh, a baby data statistician now, which is great, you know, and people have got a sense of getting some notion of what an infographic might mean with relation, with, with a, with, with, you know, related to some particular problem or challenge. Is, how, do, how do you convey this in a way that is also data intensive and, 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 and tells a story that is accessible. Well, that is, you know, pretty much bang on what we are all about in our team within the Rivers Trust because we work really closely with our comms team now and, um, you know, every, every campaign that we're involved with, we always involve the evidence and the data as well. So it's about looking at what the data tells you and turning it into a publicly accessible story. And things like, you know, tools like um, story maps are absolutely fantastic for that. You know, we, we published our State of the Rivers report last year um, and it was all, you know, written with a, a narrative and you can dive into the detail as well. So I think that's the key. It's, it's giving people something that's bite-sized and accessible, but always giving them the detail that they can dive into and... You know, I love maps and GIS because that's where I started. So for me, it's always about putting it on a map and letting people interact with it and see what it means for their area. You know, people really get it when they can see their location on a map and, you know, what's this telling me about the state of my river? Fantastic. OK, well, let's just open it out for questions, please. Yes, uh, absolutely. Questions from the audience uh, to Michelle. I mean, if you were wanting to get more people involved in the state of our rivers and how collecting data about it can can be effective. Do, do, you, do you have a success story, you know, that you can really, that's easy to explain to people and you can put out there as a sort of recruitment tool, as it were? So, well, that's a really good question. And actually, yeah, we have lots really around the Rivers Trust movement and a lot of it comes back to that citizen science theme, really. It's engaging people in collecting the data about their catchment and then understanding it and understanding what's the link to things like their behaviour as a consumer and the power that they have. So one of the examples we've got very recently is from Oxford where we worked with, uh, there was a campaign group there that really kicked off in response to the map that we put out um, of all of the untreated sewage discharges around the country. And that came from an open data um, initiative that Richard Bennion kicked off years ago. So the map instigated a sort of local campaign and we then worked with that group to support them in collecting some water quality data across the whole year. And that's really helped them target what they're asking for from the water company. So it just is a great story of using data and evidence to to kickstart the activism, because all good change starts with activists and campaigners, but it's making sure that the what you're aiming for as an activist and campaigner is realistic and it's achievable. So that is the sort of story that we can show through, you know, using the national data and then collecting the local data to fill in the gaps. Great use case, great case study. So I'm just wondering what's next, and maybe this is one for Nigel as well you know what citizen science is a very powerful tool and I think it's only just coming into its own it looks like sounds like it's starting to work in the water sector where next well not just the water sector I think you know as I mentioned earlier agriculture and, and agricultural impacts on the water environment and our wider ecology is a real issue at the moment and if we can some of the, the sort of examples we've got around the country where you get farmers involved in monitoring their soil and their water and the runoff from their farms, I think it's fantastic because, you know, suddenly they can actually use real-time information to make decisions about how they manage their land and how they manage their farm. 
um, you know, let's do that with, with businesses and supply chains and local people. You know, if you can see, for example, if you put in um, rain retention measures on your property that you're reducing the flood risk downstream of you, won't it motivate you to do more of that and to, you know, put in a rain barrel or a rain garden? So getting more real-time information and putting it in the hands of people who can make different decisions that will have an impact and then showing them what the impact of those decisions is. That's where I'd like to see us go. And that is happening more and more, isn't it? You see that in uh, appeals to do things like, you know, bird species count in your in, in your garden or the uh, estimation of the amount of insects in a particular area. I mean, there's lots of people who are recruited into that biodiversity. I think the whole move to the, the, the kind of fashion for ESG at the moment needs to be thought about in terms of what are the actual data sets that we can actually gather at scale or release at scale. One thing that does interest me though, we, we citizen science, yeah, but the water companies have a bunch of data. They aren't making open, presumably because it doesn't tell them a very good story uh, for them. Um, I mean, sometimes this just has to be extracted through um, pure public pressure. Um, this happened, I remember, famously with hospital-acquired infection data, which was a scandal in the UK um, uh, a, a little while ago. And, um, you know, as soon as that data got published, funnily enough, um, everything started to improve because there were league tables. You could see which particular hospitals were, were not doing particularly well. So, you know, in some sense, uh, the idea that they've got this data but aren't under an obligation. Now, why aren't they? What, where, where do we apply pressure? We, we collectively, as a community, can make a fuss. Presumably, the regulator can start. Why isn't there just a lot more pressure to get data that we know is held being published? I mean, I think it's it's a lack of awareness of what data is even held. You know, it's back to kind of open data principles, just being aware of what's there, let alone getting access to it and making it easy to easy to get hold of and, and use. So I think that's the first sort of battle is understanding what is held. And even, you know, we work a lot with water companies and businesses just having the right label to call something and knowing what you're asking for, it's, it's, we're still at that level, you know? We, we, we don't know what to call it because they've called it something different than the neighbours. So, you know, there's, a, there's, there's still a challenge to overcome in terms of understanding what's available, let alone getting access to it. But I do think there is huge power in, you know, we saw last year 40,000 people wrote to their MP in one weekend to demand that the government change their minds about the Environment Act and what they were putting in in terms of sewage provisions. You know, there is real power in people mobilising around a direction. So I think, you know, as, as consumers, we've got a lot more power than we realise and that's where we want to mobilise people. Um, so Michelle, as your project goes about um, giving existing data and real-time data to citizens, what will the result of that be in three, four, five years' time? What's the quantifiable result of that? So what we really want are multiple benefits from this. I mean, in terms of the, the data, we want to have um, a really sound evidence base that's been collaboratively planned and targeted at answering the questions, you know, not just collecting data because it seems like a good idea, but things that can help us um, improve the certainty around where we invest things like um, upstream natural flood management measures for example and um, soil improvement measures on farms that can reduce pollution but also um, reduce flood risk and you know manage uh, climate change so we want more certainty on investing we then want to prove the effectiveness of those measures so that, you know, through adaptive management and agile management, we can change what we do and improve the certainty going forward. But widen that, we want to empower local communities to be part of that process, you know, and there's loads of benefits to getting people out in nature and engaging with it, you know, health and well-being benefits, skills and jobs prospects. These are all the things that we want to measure alongside 
the, the sort of benefits of the data so that we can hopefully build something sustainable and, and bring in the funding to scale this up beyond the three-year pilot. Good piece of social prescribing there. Yeah, I absolutely. can just see that uh, um, get Doing out there. And absolutely. No, 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 no. And, and actually, a uh, question that occurred to me is rivers... They go somewhere. They they end up essentially discharging into sea, and and, and I'm I do sail, and I I I'm very lucky to um, sail in the Solon and in the um, uh, Chichester Harbour, which is notorious at the moment for uh, amounts of uh, discharge going in there, raw sewage going in there, storm overflows. So the busy building lots and lots of new houses as well, which will also be an issue. Um, how, how, does, how does your activity relate to, if you like, coastal or uh, estuarine kind of uh, uh, groups? Yeah, it's really important. I mean, rivers don't stop at the, at the estuary for sure. And that's something we've been working really hard on over the last few years to try and join up what rivers trusts and catchment partnerships are doing with things like the coastal partnerships. So we've had um, a number of initiatives running over the last couple of years to try and join up that kind of you know strategic planning that we're doing so we have for the last eight years or so published a catchment data package that supports some of that strategic planning um, last year we we published a coastal data package to go alongside it so it's trying to get you know people who are working mainly on freshwater and rivers to think okay you know who can i partner with that could potentially bring funding things like you know, a port downstream that is having to dredge the sediment out of the, the port, if they invest in, in measures upstream that stops the sediment getting there, that also brings many other benefits with it. You know, you're reducing flooding and you're not losing your soil off the land. And not just, you know, the link between freshwater and coastal water, but the link between groundwater and surface water as well. We've got to join sure. the whole uh -huh. water cycle up. Yeah. Yeah, mine's about citizen science. So um, if people want to get involved now, um, are you able to receive that data and when will you be ready for it? So there are already some fantastic schemes that are out there. I mean, definitely go on the Rivers Trust website and join your local Rivers Trust because many of them will have citizen science schemes. Things like um, the Riverfly Monitoring Initiative and um, Fresh Water Watch. These are national schemes that you can already join straight away. But yeah, absolutely, as the, the Catchment Monitoring Cooperative builds over the next year, we're going to be doing things like an annual water blitz, so getting people out over, you know, a day or a weekend and out, you know, joining some of the national schemes that exist and able to sort of contribute their data into uh, a national framework. So definitely things you can do now, but watch this space. We're hoping we're going to grow it big, uh, big and fast over the next few years. I'm originally from the West Country and was an early member of Surface Against Sewage oh, yeah. when I grew up down there. And um, one of the things that we had then, obviously, we didn't have the kind of digital world as we have it now so much. But we did have um, younger people getting involved in testing the water on our beaches. And there was, a, I think it was called the Blue Flag Scheme years ago that had various success and failures. But, but as an initiative, it got younger people involved in caring about... I mean, I'm just wondering over the last two years, with more people being local in their communities, have you seen a... What would the kind of best example of civic interaction be that you've seen as a result of, um, it, I guess the question is, has anything positive come out of the pandemic for you guys? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. I think um, definitely, I mean, we've got one of our um, trusts, West Country Rivers Trust, that cover Devon and Cornwall and that part of the world. They've set up a scheme called um, CSI, West Country CSI, Citizen Science Investigations. And they've now got 400 volunteers going out regularly collecting water quality data and also you know looking for really positive signs you know it's not all bad news you know building some good news what are the wildlife spottings you know have you seen one of the beavers that are now uh, spreading across the west country and otters and things like that so that is a fantastic good news story and you know some of that data is absolute gold dust for then West Country Rivers Trust targeting, for example, where they send their farm advisors to work with farmers because, you know, if you can see across a whole catchment which, which of the tributary rivers are consistently creating the biggest water pollution problem, you can target your resources there. So, you know, the volunteers get motivated because they can see how their data is being used as well. We did 
some citizen data projects in uh, New Zealand around uh, using school children to monitor construction activities and, and the risk on river pollution. A great success. Community was fully engaged. Um, but then we had a similar project in a city I don't want to mention where the data became uh, used by activists and they measured uh, air quality data at points that clearly weren't representative of the air quality of the city. So it became very political very quickly. So how, how do you deal with um, provenance? Yeah. And, and is that, for Nigel, for the ODI something to help where we launch? Because we would love as Arab to kick off more of these schemes. Yeah. But somebody needs to look at the provenance because I think that's a great point. it becomes yeah. political at some point. I mean, it's a great point, by the way, about, about fair sampling. Yeah. Uh, so that you can actually represent uh, what reality is as opposed to what a bunch of uh, individuals might want reality to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we have a term for it even in the Rivers Trust. It's vigilante citizen science. You know, we want the data that's collected to be actually collaboratively agreed before you go out and do your sampling. So it's not about just letting people, you know, go where they have an agenda necessarily. And, you know, that's not a simple thing either because a lot of citizen science groups say, no, you can't tell people where to go and you can't predetermine it. But I think it's really important that you make sure that any data that you're collecting are fit for purpose and that you are, you know, targeting your monitoring where it's going to answer the questions that you're trying to, to answer. So it's, it's going to be a really interesting few years while we try and balance those things among many other challenges. I think that speaks to, a, I mean, obviously, uh, just about everything you've said, I'm thinking, well, this is obviously an area where we ought to be able to, to collaborate together, find a way to, to build a common program. And it, it has all those ingredients, because on the one hand, there is something you can mobilize people around. There's a bit of an outrage here, you know, think it should just be bloody better. Uh, on the other hand, um, it can be better. And you can see these rapid improvements in some contexts, and you can see um, the real fruits of, uh, of, of, of that environmental conservation and a better stewardship. Um, so I, I do think that's really interesting that we don't fall prey to just one way of thinking about it, which I guess is one reason why you look to work with, with regulators and with the actual um, originating water authorities, for example. Yeah, I mean, we have to work with all of the partners in this space because you're not going to achieve the solutions. It's not a simple, you know, press a button and you fix the problem. We've got to change the way we incentivize and regulate and, and fund all of the activity that impacts on the environment. If we did instrument the, um, the, 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 the water companies in real time, what would we notice in terms of their, well, suppose we could do it without them knowing we're doing it, but just, just to notice, do they have patterns in which they know that surveillance in some sense is uh, more or less acute? So, I mean, in terms of patterns that you can see if you've got real-time monitoring, certainly when it comes to, you know, sewage discharges, you've got real diurnal pattern, for example, you know, I mean, maybe not so much since the pandemic, but people coming home from work and, you know, turning the kettle on and, and having a wash and using the toilet, you get a real spike in sewage discharges a few hours later than that. But guess what? The spot sampling that the government does is during the day. So you're not picking up that load. And so, you know, we've been pushing for a long time for real time water quality data that can tell you so much more than a, a spot sample, you know, at one set period in the day. Um, we do a lot of work with meaningful youth engagement and a couple of the previous questions alluded to citizen science and engaging youth um, in uh, in you know, climate action and whatnot. Um, just wanted to know from your experience what youth engagement activities um, have been really successful and, and how do you how do you get meaningfully engaged in um, safeguarding their health features and because they're they're going to be inheriting these yeah. systems uh, that we're speaking about. Thank you. That's um, you know really what the Rivers Trusts are all about is education and engaging you know everyone in the community. So we've got a lot of our member trusts that, you know, engage schools in um, things like, you know, they have a river lab and sometimes they'll take the children out to the, to the river and sometimes they'll actually, you know, some of our trusts have got a river on a lorry that they can take into the playground and, you know, you've got an actual sort of river channel that you can play with and 
They bring trays of invertebrates and get them really engaged. So everything from, you know, young children at primary school right through, we've got lots of partnerships with universities and, you know, master's students getting engaged, um, right up to sort of, you know, apprenticeships with um, the chance to sort of learn on the job and, you know, broaden people's career prospects. So absolutely, it's got to be about, you know, um, working with young people as well as, you know, older people as well. And I think that's one of the challenges for citizen science, actually, is that it, it tends to be, you know, maybe older people, middle class, middle aged, and, you know, dare I say it, you know, very undiverse representation that have got the time to go out and do this. We really want to turn that around. We want to see how we can make it about training people and skilling people up. And, you know, especially at the moment, I think that's really critical to... To, to be able to sort of, you know, give people something back and, and get them out, get them connected, but get them trained up and skilled up as well. Um, Tamara from the Blockchain and Climate Institute and Outsmart Circular Intelligence. Um, I was wondering if there is a due date set for this uh, environmental data standardization that you're uh, implementing. Okay. Yeah, so we are just about to kick off the innovation project, hopefully um, by the end of this month. So, and it's going to run over the next three years, but, you know, we certainly don't see that as the, the only kind of time frame that we're working to. It's an innovation and transformation project that will pump prime the activity that we need. Um, so we want to see some real progress over the next two or three years, but we're going to be aligning lots of other projects around this and, and you know, big as the funding is for this, it's not enough to build a huge data infrastructure. So we're going to you know, bring in the key partners who are working on other initiatives and trying to align them to it. So how is all this funded? Like you have administration of project uh, equipment and data databases. Yeah. Uh, where does that come from and what's the sustainability of the funding? So that's a golden question as well. So this current project that we're kicking off is off what innovation funding, which is water company money that's been allocated into an innovation pool that the water companies have to bid into with partners. So that's what we've done for this project, but we've also, as the Rivers Trust and many of the partner organisations, also put funding in. Um, we draw our funding from a whole mix of places, from government, from corporate partners who are invested in water stewardship and you know things like securing their supply chains going forward. We get public donations. You know, we have had EU funding and that's obviously dwindling now as well and, you know, research funding as well. So we've got to take a blended finance approach to everything we do because that's the way you bring the multi-benefits and it's the same with the, the sort of big data projects that we're kick, kicking off as well. And you're, you're, you know, you're a consequential organisation, you're 45 people, you're employee number five, you were telling me. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's got real overheads and, 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 a, and, and a real... Um, financial requirement and that project was not an inconsiderable amount of money i mean so 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 um but it is sustainability i guess is the challenge right exactly it's you know it's finding that ongoing funding and that's part of one of the work packages in this program is evaluation and sustainability so let's you know decide on what benefits we're trying to evaluate make sure we've got the metrics in place and then use that to build the business case for ongoing funding because we know, you know, from all the work we've done and the experience we've got in these 45 members of the team, that this can sell itself. Without that data and evidence, you cannot um, tackle all the problems that we're facing and you can't direct, you know, the considerable amount of money that's out there for green finance investment. You need that data and evidence. So we, one of the biggest challenges we've got now is to you know, show the, the benefit of what we're doing over the next three years to secure that additional investment. Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm from the Think Tank Demos. Um, I have another quiz or question about the uh, citizen science aspect. So in terms of the areas that you're looking at, do they tend to be more rural in towns and cities? And do you find or are you expecting to find a different in, difference in the way that people engage in citizen science in different areas? Yeah. We've got eight demo catchments and they are a good representation of both rural and urban and different, you know, land use types and geology and um, all of that. So 
but definitely there's a difference between rural and urban in so many ways and you know some of our more urban trusts have got absolutely fantastic experience in you know engaging people in um, really getting involved things like collaborative modelling that's going on in London where they've got um, you know on the Salmon and Dollis Brooks we've got the local community out collecting ground truth information they then sit down with the modellers and the academics in the university and see their data being plugged into the model that then tells them where you could put a wetland in that catchment that would you know reduce pollution and reduce flooding of their own home so there's things you can do in urban areas that you maybe can't do in a bigger rural catchment but you know things like the CSI scheme and, and um, invertebrate monitoring and outfall safaris there's loads of really good opportunities to engage people in rural areas as well. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, one of the projects that we have here at the ODR program to work. It's quite a big program that we've been working on for the last five years. And we see another five years ahead. Um, it is, is looking at sort of activity uh, data to get p more people active. Yeah. Um, so I see huge similarities between the journey you're on and that particular sector is on as well. And uh, in, the, in the early days when you think you can do everything, uh, you soon realize actually it's a lot harder than you think it is. And that some of the motivations of the actors coming to uh, Nigel's point um, can actually vary off into different directions. So I'm re I'm, clearly there's lots that we can share with you and our experiences through that program. And I'd be delighted to pick up a conversation on that. But I'm interested to know, is it, what is the priorities that you're really focusing on? Because that is what can actually really shift the dial. Whereas if you go too wide, it yeah. just becomes a, a, a very sort of small impact as a result. So are you talking about the priorities for people using, you know, the environment for recreation or...? I, well, I look more at the priorities for the programme of work that you're embarking okay. on right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, I mean, I'd be really interested to hear more about the, the work you're doing, because one of the things that we've tried to do is capture, you know, where are people using the environment? And that's very hard to collate that data because a lot of it's commercial and, and not open. But in terms of, of focusing what we're doing with this project, the Catchment Monitoring Cooperative, that's why we're working in these demo catchments and we are going to make sure that, you know, what we can demonstrate over the next three years clearly links that sort of need for data with the outcomes that you can influence with it. So each of those demo catchments will have an initial focus and it could be soil health or bathing water quality or agriculture. Um, we've got an initial focus in each of them, but we've also got to make sure that what we're building in that national framework is fit for purpose in all the other catchments as well. So we can't focus it too narrowly. Otherwise, you know, we're not, we're risking not bringing everyone on board with, with that sort of umbrella strategic direction. So it is really tricky and it's gonna be, you know, I'm under no illusions, it's going to be easy, but we haven't found anyone yet who thinks it's a bad idea to try and do this. So I think that goodwill and that willingness to, to try and collaborate is gonna take us a long way. So I haven't heard anybody else doing a similar project the way you just described it. It's really exciting. But, but us as industry and the um, sort of larger companies involved in the water business are all building right now science capabilities. Uh, our focus is more natural flood management, uh, biodiversity at sort of large scales, uh, urban planning, um, but also technical infrastructure around earth observation and is there a way to perhaps connect those programs together? Because there are, like, technical infrastructure, the way we do maps, the way we, the way we map data onto grids, you know, we could probably open source or share. We're not really that precious about. I don't think anybody in our company knows, though, some amazing yeah. stuff you guys are doing. So I wonder whether there's a yeah. connection with industry we could yeah. sort of build. I, I think that's really where we want to get to over this next few years is starting to explore, you know, what can we join up with, really? Because, you know, there's no way with our sort of small organisation we can tackle this challenge on our own. So, you know, we, we've seen even through developing this project over the last 18 months, as we start to, con you know, we ran a consultation on the initial idea we got 90 organisations responding and throwing in ideas and, and, you know, from that we started to write joint project bids and that's what it's all about. It's getting the word out there 
and communicating initially. You know, some of the, the sort of things we've been reading around why transformation projects fail, and one of the key lessons is, you know, you've got to do about 10 times more communication than you ever thought you'd need to because you've got to try and join people up and, and you know, align people around that vision. So I think there's huge potential, but we're going to have to do a lot of talking. Look, Michelle, I just want to take an opportunity. I, I, I asked my team to uh, find me a guest from an environmental campaigning organization that actually used open data and citizen science to drive regulatory and industry change. And I can't imagine they would ever land anybody quite so perfectly uh, 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 tuned to that. Also, it seems that you might well be dealing with some more joint project writing applications because I can just see about a million things we could be doing together. Uh, you know, you talked tonight about data as infrastructure and data assurance and data institutions and the literacy we require. That's just what we do. And there's this sense of connecting, as you say, the private and public sphere and individual and organizations together for something that everybody cares about. I really do care about this stuff. So thank you very much. Perhaps we could just show our appreciation. Thank you.